right? The IID, so I can write it as a sum, right, of the individual components and their expectation values. Now this is just the sigma i's, right? Sigma i squares there. So I get the sum of sigma i squares. And I said that's fixed. That's on my own. Right? So the expected value of the length is R squared. I mean, the, the length squared is R squared. Right? Do you all agree now? No, R, well, it's sort of an effective dimension of it, but let's not worry about this. So it's, it, I just define it this way. I said these, these individual components are all independent of each other, and they have a certain variance, and the square of this, I mean, the variance is sum up to a constant, independent of the dimension. So I can make this larger and larger, right? Because otherwise everything blows up, right? Uh, all reasonable fields have this property. So now, what else do we know? Um, because basically we see something here like, like let's, um, if you make them all equal, and let's say Z is in, in Rn and n will go to infinity and we choose sigma i squared as one over n. So then each component actually has the same variance. It sums to one because here the index goes from one to n. So one over n times n is one, so r would be one. And then it's basically the same as, I, as if I were to sum up n, 1 over n, the sum of Gaussian random variables which are distributed according to uh, mean zero and variance one. So you're summing identical random variables and you take the mean of this. Now what do we know about that? Hmm? Central limit theorem. Central limit theorem or the law of large numbers as n goes to infinity. So that's basically saying that all the realizations of such a vector will all have the same length with prob probability one and the length will be one or r square if I choose a different setting of sigmas. So all the realizations sit geometrically on the shell of a surface, I mean of a sphere of ra radius r. Now, in, drawn in 2D, that means that the measure concentrates on a circle. Of course, we're talking high dimensions here, so it's a hypersphere, right? right? So it, it, it's a singular object. In high dimensions, the Gaussians become a singular object. So you can't do the standard, I mean, it's pretty much the same setting as saying in 1D, I replace the Gaussian by a Dirac delta, right? So in 1D, this is singular, and in 2D, the circle is also singular, so it has volume zero. Even worse, in, in 1D, you can shift the Gaussian a little bit, and it will still overlap in a sense, right? Now, if you do the same here, and I would change the coefficient so that I get a different R, I get a different circle, which corresponds here to the fact I have a different direct delta and place at a different place. They have no overlap anymore. And in mathematics, this is called, they, they're not absolute continuous anymore with respect to each other, they're singular. And that's an, another very important concept we're gonna use, we need, because this is what we do in data simulation, um, that basically you have your prior and the posterior is always absolute continuous with respect to your prior. We'll get to this in a second. Anyway, so this is why we need these measures, right? And you have to, of course you can say, well, I always discretize, so I'm always in finite dimensional spaces, so why do I need to worry? But, you know, this n in your case, if you do geophysics, is pretty large, right? 
And so you're very close to it, and you see the imprint of these infinite dimensional objects in your numerics. And, and this is a cur cur curse of dimensionality that appears in, in data simulation. Right? Um, but uh, I hope that, that it's now clear that in the infinite limit, there is this object behind where you really have uh, singular measures. And that's why we talk about uh, measures. Right? Why we need this kind of. Of course, here you could say, OK, now I just restrict the integration to, to this uh, shell. Uh, and then I'm fine again. But uh, of course, if you have more complicated measures, then uh, it's not so easy anymore. And, and, and oh, so this has fallen asleep now. Um, um, well, I can see it now, but uh, what is it saying? It's coming. OK, good. So, so basically, this is just a shorthand to remind us that uh, there can be more complicated objects. Now, in practice, you know, most of the time you can you work with, uh, with uh, the standard integrals uh, you have here. So, okay. Right, so the likelihood. Um, well, I don't think I have to say too much about this. Um, again, it's primarily notation. Uh, this is basically saying Given uh, my variable of interest, uh, what is the likelihood of observing, the probability of observing uh, what I measure? And I think in most of the lectures or previous lectures we've seen in most of the geophysical applications, uh, the measurement error is typically assumed to be Gaussian. So uh, this whole thing uh, basically looks like this quadratic form. It has this forward operator in it. and, and, and um, and that's it. We will get back to the specifics uh, uh, later. But for now, this is just uh, such a quantity. Now, in, in the geosciences, I think we're in a luxury position where we generally can um, write down this thing. In many applications, actually, you only know that it exists. In machine learning, there are lots of applications where you might actually, what you can do, given as that, you might be able to sample from such a distribution, but you cannot write it down. And that, that leads to a lot of interesting algorithms. So it, it's called untractable likelihoods. But we are lucky here, I think, most of us, um, that uh, we, we know this. And we, uh, sometimes we can even, if it's a Gaussian distribution, we, we can normalize it. So it's a proper probability in the sense that if you integrate over y, then uh, it integrates out to 1. Um, and yeah, and the, the most examples we've seen so far in this, in this week are of this type. Um, and, and then there's one expectation value which is very important, um, uh, not so much if you do state estimation, but if you do parameter estimation in, in uh, and if this afternoon there will be some handout, uh, the, um, hand on session on parameter estimation, uh, that quantity might feature then. Um, uh, and that's basically the expected value of this, if you integrate out the Zs. So you, you take your prior um, and you integrate out um, uh, you take the expectation of, of this function with respect to z, and then it becomes a function of y. And that basically tells you how well your prior fits um, the data. And so you can base, uh, uh, you can choose, I mean, that tells you something whether you've chosen a good prior or a bad prior. Uh, yeah? So if this is a large number, uh, it's good. If this is a small number, then that's not so good, right? Um, and so this is just, again, um, notation. Right, and now we come to Bayes' rule. So we have the joint distribution. We first write down the joint distribution of the observed quantities and, and, and the variables of interest, z. And, and uh, I hope you all see in conditional probabilities the, the, the rules of conditional <coughs> probabilities. So, so we said, basically, this is a conditional probability of y given z. The prior gives you the probability of z, and you can combine this, and that gives you the joint distribution. Now, you can do it the other way around. You can say, um, you can say z conditioned on y, and this quantity we just discussed about, the probability of y on its own, which is a marginal distribution of this joint distribution by integrating out z. That's what we did on the previous transparency, essentially. 
Now, as I said, this is just often this is ignored in Bayesian inference because it's just a normalizing constant. Because once you have a data, you have a y, then it's just a number. And it's just a scaling constant, and we ignore it often if you do just state estimation. But if you want to compare different models, you definitely need that quantity. Um, OK, and then you get the posterior density. That's the one you're interested in. Uh, that conditioned on the data you, you, you're given. And it's just a joint div divided by this marginal. And, uh, and we use this again. And as I said, often this quantity down here is ignored because it's just a constant. Uh, um, and, uh, and so you get this quantity. OK, and I will use uh, a star for posterior measures. Stars will be posterior measures. Generally, without a star, it's just the prior or the likelihood or whatever, if it's not clear. But it's the stars are always the things um, um, that um, we have here. OK, so. Yeah, so the star, I leave the y out. So the, the star is replacing the y. So I don't have to always write the y. The, the y so the star is exactly it's replacing the, the y. OK. So now, here comes another notation. And it's a bit annoying for maybe that uh, uh, it's a radon nicodym derivative. It's again, just take it as a proxy for something that can be a bit complicated. And you just remi it reminds you that there can be things that are a little bit more complicated. In the standard case, uh, it's basically related. It's a proxy for saying, what do I need to do if I want to compute an expectation of a certain, with respect to a certain measure, but I have another measure, and can I replace this one measure by another measure? So it's uh, a bit of like change of variables in integration theory. So it's down here, essentially. So, so here, this is the posterior measure. This is uh, the expectation of the g function, like that could be just the, the, the x, uh, the, the z, just the mean, or it could be the variance, uh, then z square, things like this. So, so this is the expectation. Now, um, we can express this integral in terms of the prior. So p is a prior. And and to ch do this change of from going from one measure to another while keeping the same uh, expected value, um, we need this change. And they, they just to know it by the radon nicodym. This is a radon nicodym derivative in a way. Um, and in our particular case, if everything, um, the, the radon nicodym derivative is nothing else than the likelihood, the normalized likelihood. So it is equivalent to um, if the densities exist, it's a new star divided by p. So this was the density of the, the prior. And this is if the density exists, that's the, um, the density of the posterior. But as we said, not always, the densities don't always need to exist. And then we need to talk about this more general concept of this radon nicodym derivative. Uh, but as I said, it's just a proxy for changing methods. So now, um, so if this radon nicodym derivative exists, or it exists if, um, The measure are absolute continuous. So clearly, let's say you uh, you have um, this measure. This is the distribution uh, uh, which you want to compute your um, integral with respect to. So that could be the Q star in this case. Now, if I have another distribution that looks like this here, that would be by my p, then clearly this, the support of this is contained in the support of p. So um, taking an integral with respect to this can be replaced by an integral with respect to that because it covers the region. And so in this case, dq star, d 
BP exists. Now, if you fl would flip the role and you would say, um, I want to do it the other way around, I have actually something um, where I want to integrate with respect to Q star, but I really have to integrate, I mean, I really want to integrate with respect to P, uh, but uh, I only have given like Q star, and obviously it doesn't work because you don't see everything. So you cannot. Uh, faithfully approximate integrals um, with respect to P by using Q star. So then the radon nicotine derivative does not exist, and the, it's said that the measure P is not absolute continuous with respect to Q star. So why is this important in high dimensions? Because as we've seen, basically, um, uh, you can think of this as a high dimensional Gaussian just being concentrated on a circle. Um, now, if your real model is, is basically this here, that's where the, the truth is really there, and you, you now work with the wrong prior, then Bayes' law tells you the radon nicodym will exist, but it will be concentrated on the wrong circle. It will even converge to something, but it will be wrong. And there's no way to correct it. Because your, your true quantity sits on a different circle. So it's just a different Gaussian, infinite dimensional Gaussian. Right? So that's why prior choice in high dimensions is something very, very important. The choice of the prior. How you choose the prior in high dimensions. I know, it's a lot of mind buckling. This circle, this was the, the magnitude of a high dimensional multivariate. Yeah, AIDL. it's a, yeah. So, can you give an example? <laughs> Brown in motion, we will come back to this. Brown in motion. Okay. I will come back to this example. Let's, uh, have you, who has heard about Brown in motion? So, the random walk in, in you sort of, with a certain probability, Gaussian distribution, you go up and down. Uh, and, and that's a good example. Uh, where this arises, this problem. 